Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. And we start with two big stories tonight. A stunning wreck as a semi smashes into other cars and then falls off the side of the Rouge Bridge, crashing to the ground below. And breaking news from Washington, where President Trump's health care plan has cleared a major hurdle by passing in the House. We have heated reaction from both sides. All coming up, but let's start things off here at 5 with the weather and the flood watch that is in effect right now. For live radar is a sea of green, and that is not going to change anytime soon. Uh, ben called it. Rain started right in the middle of the morning commute and has not lit up since. It has not. Let's get over to Ben right now. A lot more rain on the way, too, Ben. It is, guys, and we think that this is going to pick up. In fact, it is becoming more intense right now in our south zone. But the good news first, uh, this stuff has been light to moderate through most of the day, and it looks like most of the roadways and the pumping systems and the drainage ditches are are keeping up with the rain so far, uh, but we look down into our south zone and you can see these pockets of yellow. That's where the light rain is becoming more intense going around Monroe County, especially that 75 stretch up through down river. Further to the south, there's still more to go. There's another pocket of rain uh, that's just down there around Fort Wayne and into northern parts of Ohio. We really don't anticipate there's going to be any widespread let up in this rain through the evening hours tonight. That's one of the reasons we're in a flood watch. It extends through Friday evening, but we are going to see rain that's going to go through all the way uh, through the day on Saturday. So you put those three days together and our rainfall totals are going to start reaching three inches in parts of the area south and east to Especially we'll break this down in your four zone forecast and tell you when this race is finally going to wrap up coming up in a few minutes, guys. OK, Ben, thank you. Now to breaking news out of Washington, where the House has passed President Trump's health care plan. Here are some of the broad strokes. The e, uh, this bill would end tax penalties for people who don't purchase health insurance. It also halts Medicaid expansion. It includes eight billion dollars for states to pay with patients with pre-existing conditions. Now, all of this is just out of the House. It still needs to pass through the Senate, and it looks to have a tough ride there. Blaine Alexander with a closer look at a vote that went right down to the wire. There you saw Michigan Congressman Debbie Dingell. Blaine? And hello to you from Capitol Hill. This was close. Republicans needed 216 votes to win. They got 217, but enough to give President Trump a much needed victory. Thank you very much. This really a major is legislative win for the president and the Republicans and who delivered it. it Make no mistake, this is a repeal and a replace of Obamacare. Make no mistake about it. The bill is passed. Passed without a single Democratic vote, now moving the fight to the Senate. Starting today, Obamacare is on its way out the door. I urge my colleagues, come to your senses, defeat this bill. The vote coming after weeks of negotiations, amendments, even personal phone calls from the president, whose first try at health care ended in embarrassing defeat. It died right here on the floor. Now it's come back to life like a zombie, even more scary than before. The House bill would roll back Medicaid expansion and decrease subsidies for low income families, meaning higher costs for middle income families, higher subsidies, lower costs, and it would end the individual mandate among the most hated parts of Obamacare. The bill would also keep coverage for pre-existing conditions, but if states opt out, costs could rise. Some lawmakers upset they were rushed to vote before knowing what this plan will cost and who it will cover. And now this bill will go on to the Senate, where essentially this entire debate will restart. A long way to go still if this bill is to ever make it to the president's desk. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. Interesting. I spent a lot of time on the phone uh, with folks in Washington this afternoon. You really get a sense of the understanding of uh, this is a very high stakes game politically. Absolutely. Never mind exactly what happens with the, with the actual bill itself, but everybody understands how high the stakes are uh, the next time around. Every, both sides are going to hear about their vote on this. Now, if you're wondering how our Michigan representatives voted on the bill, here's a quick breakdown. Yeah, and as you would expect, it falls right along party lines. All nine Michigan Republicans voted yes. That includes Representative Fred Upton, who threatened to derail the bill earlier in the week, but changed his mind after a meeting at the White House. Uh, Democrats all voted no. That includes, uh, as you saw earlier there, uh, speaking this afternoon on the House floor, Debbie Dingell, and the Dean of the House, John Conyers, who uh, released a, a statement on the bill that says, quote, I've served in Congress for 52 years, and it's hard for me to recall a time when we voted on something so obviously and intentionally harmful to seniors and working people in this country.
End of quote. And on the GOP side, Representative Mike Bishop of Rochester says, quote, the American Health Care Act is about freeing all families, individuals, and small businesses from the crushing costs and lack of choices under the status quo of the last seven years. End quote. Much more reaction coming up here at 6 o'clock, and we'll also continue to update the story, including the statements from other uh, local officials as they come in to us at clickondetroit.com. All right, an absolutely terrifying thing to see in southwest Detroit. A semi-truck falls off the Rouge Bridge. Three people injured, and all of them, the semi-driver included, are expected to be okay. Let's get to Paula Tutman, who's been on this story since it broke. Paula, it is so hard to believe that that driver was able to survive this. When you see that video, it is incredible to know that the, uh, excuse me, the truck driver actually did survive. And that's why ultimately, even with injuries, this will end up being a good news story. But also, if you feel like this is deja vu all over again, it is. Because just a little while ago, another truck went over the side, almost in the same spot. The video shows us this could be a very different story. Not many truckers who plunged 35 feet off a freeway bridge live to tell the tale. This trucker, Will, suffering a reported broken arm, leg, and injured jaw, he says he hit a slick spot in the road, but Michigan State Police say it was excessive speed for the current road and weather conditions. Juan Munoz lives across from the overpass and says this is a constant problem. There's always cars slamming into the side of the freeway, so I thought it was something like another car, um, car accident, but then it was like louder, and that's when I realized it was falling when I ran out like the semi thing was just on the floor. MDOT says the bridge does have some eccentricities. The roadway though, it is a bridge. It goes up to a peak and then it goes down as you make your way over the water and railroads that are underneath. If traffic is speeding to go up the hill, you know, increasing the speed to go up the hill, drivers do need to realize as you go down on the other side, that speeds have to be lowered because you are going down, gravity's pulling your vehicle. But there are no anomalies in the design that can be blamed for the accidents. It's driver error for the slopes and bends in the road, according to MDOT. In today's accident, a total of three people were injured. Two motorists whose vehicles were struck by this truck when it jackknifed, and also the driver. Incredible, none of these injuries are being considered life-threatening. As for that bend in the bridge, MDOT is aware that drivers tend to drive too fast, and in its current construction plan, will be adding signage, urging them to slow down. Yeah, and so when you get to these areas in the bridges, when they go kind of turn or go up or down, uh, obviously MDOT is saying you really do need to honor the speed limit. The speed limit is there. Uh, the engineers and the designers basically decide how to drive that bridge, particularly in weather like this. You need to actually slow down below the speed limit very quickly. I do want to go back to that truck driver. So lucky to be alive. He is going to be charged with the cause. Whether or not he is ticketed, uh, depends on the trooper he, who is still doing the investigation. Guys? We're also following another semi-accident. This one out of Southfield. The crash happened this morning on I-696 just past the Lodge Freeway. That's where a semi lost control and crashed into a ditch. You see it there. Uh, no word on any injuries in that case. Yeah. All right, now to Roseville, where a man has been charged after his dogs viciously mauled his mother and her boyfriend. 28-year-old Robert Lawton faces two felonies in the attack Sunday night at his home on Normal Street. Let's get to Jermont Terry. And Jermont, uh, his mother, who was badly injured, was in the courtroom with him. Yeah, Devin, the mother is continuing to show support to her son. That's despite what she and her boyfriend endured in this vicious dog attack. As you mentioned, the son is officially charged today. And for the first time, we are hearing the 911 call made during that attack. Robert Lawton waits to bond out of jail after Macomb County prosecutors threw two counts of owning a dangerous animal causing serious injury. This was Lawton's pit bull terrier, Bruce. This week, Bruce attacked Lawton's mother, Suzette, and her boyfriend. I need an ambulance now. And it's your dog bite. A neighbor's frantic call to 911 shows the fear moments after the dog turned on Suzette Lawton for the second time in three weeks. It's real. It's her arm is torn. The skin is hanging. Okay, and I can give you some instructions to help her, okay? I got to go find out about the other person. Is the dog still loose, and what kind of dog is it? I don't know. 
Bruce was eventually put down, but listen as someone screams, kill the dog during the attack. There has got to be accountability for that. And that's why prosecutors decided to charge Lawton. When I talked to him earlier this week, he said he purchased a muzzle after the first attack, adding he and his mother decided to keep Bruce. You know, I just don't understand what I did. I just owned a dog and he messed up. My dog's paid for it now. And now Lawton is paying as he could spend up to four years in prison if convicted. People need to realize they're responsible for their dogs, they're responsible for the behavior of the dog, and if they can't be responsible, then they must, you know, they should get rid of it. And I think this will send a clear message. To as you can see, the Roseville police chief taking this very seriously, advising other people, be careful if you own a dog and make care and take care of it. As for Lawton, I'm told that he's uh, looking for an attorney and he also bonded out on the $5,000 cash surety bond tonight. He's just worried about what will happen next. We'll keep you updated. For now, reporting live in Roseville, Jermont Terry, Local 4. Boy, that was hard to listen to. Yeah, the, the, those the phone screams. Calls. Yeah. Uh, Detroit police are looking for two gunmen after a deadly shooting outside a gas station. The shooting happened late last night at a, this Valero station on Pearson Street in Seven Mile. That's where a 21 year old man was killed and two others were injured when two men shot up a van with five people inside. At this time, it's unclear what led up to that shooting. If you know anything, contact Detroit police. Now, Detroit Police Chief James Craig is making a big request tonight. New here at 5, we'll tell you what he's asking for that he says will keep his officers much safer on the streets. Also, Detroit's music heavyweights coming together for a very special event. Ahead here at 530, we'll tell you more about how you can see Aretha Franklin for free this summer. Sean? Only on Local 4, an incredible rescue on Detroit's west side. I was carrying, carrying, struggling. And that's just the start of this story. New at 6. Macomb County Clerk Karen Spranger has made it clear she is against the relocation of some county staff and records. But wait until you see what she did early this morning to try to stop that move. Plus the emotional reunion between a local mom and another mom who somehow knew what to do during a little boy's health crisis. All coming up at six. Now here at five, uh, the word hero gets thrown around probably too much, but the man you're about to meet defines it. Last night, when his house started burning, Darian Johnson saved his entire family, but that's just one part of this incredible story. Our Sean Lay introduces you to a man who's been through more than most can even imagine. I'm going to take you inside this home on the west side. It was burning overnight. And Darian Johnson, he's going to show you how he saved the five children who were inside and then carried his disabled father outside. And that is just the start of Darian's amazing story. Ride my bike every day. Darian Johnson is always on the move, despite being told he'd never move again. Doctor said I won't walk again. I ride, I ride my bike every day. Johnson rides his bike from Detroit to a new job at a food prep business in Warren. 24, 24 miles a day. Last night? That's where it started at, mm, the mattress. Whoa. He again had to move quickly. Three kids were on this mattress on the third floor when it caught fire. Darian got the kids out and then tried to put the fire out. I was right here with a pot of water trying to throw it over there. With the kids safely out of the house next, his dad, Anthony, a diabetic double amputee, was on the second floor. Thank goodness Darian was there. I cuffed him and we start, and we start walking down the stairs. It's remarkable that Darian could make these saves. One was right there. He was shot seven times February 1st, 2016, by a masked robber. Got shot twice in my hip and four times in my legs. One right here, one right here, one right here, one right here. One bullet he carries with him. If you, if you, if I bend over like this, you can see it still protruding on my back. Darian survived that attack. He helped his family survive the fire, and this 27-year-old doesn't ask for much. I don't want no charitable nothing. I just want a place that I can call home. He's too busy making saves. I was carrying, carrying, struggling. And he's on the move food. again. I'm about to go get the food. Where's Darian headed now to deliver food to some of those kids that he saved and also then hop back on his bike and head right back to work. From Detroit's west side, Sean Lay, Local 4. 
Incredible. When you, and you look at what it is now, yeah. and you try to picture what it was that he was marching through. My Amazing. Goodness. Yeah. It really is. All right, on the bright side, there aren't going to be any uh, brown lawns anytime soon. <laughs> That's safe <laughs> I to mean, say. My goodness. Yep. Uh, we've got some live pictures <laughs> from our Mount Clemens sky it, cam. That, that pretty much says trust it Trust us, that's Mount Clemens. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best we can do. Could yeah. be anywhere, literally. Yeah. It really yeah. could. Yeah, we've got a flood watch in effect too. So we do for most of the area, and that runs through Friday evening. This is a flood watch, not a flash flood watch. Mm -hmm. So the, the really the effects of this are going to be cumulative, and we'll probably see the worst effects towards the tail end of this event. But these are the totals that we're seeing so far, and numbers have eclipsed the one inch mark here in Adrian, and very close to that in Monroe. Here in our south zone, this is one of the places that we think are end up seeing the highest uh, reports of rain. Once we get through the three day stretch, numbers do fall off a bit as you work your way north, about three or two thirds of an inch here at the airport. Ann Arbor 6500s and just over a half inch in the city. And then those numbers uh, definitely start becoming a little bit lower as you work your way into the north zone. Flint about a third of an inch and about a quarter there in Lapeer. So let's show you where the rain is right now. Still on top of us. No surprise there. You look down to the south and you think, well, look, we're finally getting some breaks in that rain, uh, but the dynamics are going to start becoming better as we get overnight. And you can sort of see here where the swirl that low is, but better when we switch the channel on the satellite, it's picking up all that Gulf moisture, moving it right into the Great Lakes. And that curl right there, that's the low that's in West Tennessee right now. So as that low gets closer to us, the dynamics get better, the lift becomes more effective, and we see more rain uh, that you see just continues right over the top of us through the day on Friday. And then once we get on Friday afternoon and evening, about 8 o'clock, we'll finally see an end to the widespread rain temporarily because this low is going to actually move backwards a bit. And we'll see a second, or really a third push of rain, I guess, as we get through the day on Saturday and then finally drying out by the time we get in to Sunday. So forecast tonight goes to 44. We'll call it windy with rain. Uh, there's really nothing else that's going to be out there. Four zone forecast breaks down those totals starting in the metro zone, and this is where we'll see some of the higher numbers uh, possibly could be getting over three inches of rain. Now remember, this is a three day total all the way uh, really through Saturday, and the south zone numbers are going to be close to three inches down here towards the state line. This is probably where we'll see the highest numbers, but Look at how quickly these d uh, diminish as you work your way north in the west zone here. Still around three inches possible in Canton and then quickly into the one inch totals only for parts of Genesee County where that rain is going to be lighter and you'll probably see a lot more breaks as we get during the day on Friday. And then in our north zone, a lot of one inch totals, but still some two and possibly three inches towards the southern end of St. Clair County. Temperatures not going much of anywhere. We're going to be stuck in the 40s until Saturday afternoon. We'll barely touch 50 and then on Sunday, when the rain exits, we'll get a mix of sun and clouds in here. Temperatures into the mid 50s, but we're going to have to wait on the 60s. Still no even normal temperatures. Everything is below average through that entire stretch. So we're really focused, obviously, on the next three days. Yeah. We'll keep watching that rain. Because they've got a certain sameness to them. <laughs> they do, <laughs> yes. unfortunately. Yeah. Have you seen any of these? No. Pretty what funky. Well, we're actually kind of we're learning our way through them exactly. now, aren't we? It's, yeah. yeah. It's a new toy. Let's ask Frank McGeorge, <laughs> Doc. Well, that's the question. Is this a distracting toy or a helpful tool? Coming up, what experts really think of fidget spinners and if they truly can help kids concentrate. <laughs> All right, but first, devastating new revelations in court as a man is charged with beating his wife to death with a hammer. We'll be right back. A Pontiac man accused of killing his wife was back in court today. 55-year-old Patrick Johnson was originally charged with assault with intent to murder after beating his wife with a hammer when she asked for a divorce. Those charges were changed to include open murder after his wife died in the hospital from those injuries. Today, Johnson was in court for his preliminary exam where the officer who arrested him said he openly admitted to beating his wife. Did he indicate anything to you? He, he uh, mentioned I hit her a couple times and then he said that he asked me if she did. Johnson's case will now head to trial. If convicted, he'll likely face life in prison. Now to a local four update as a Detroit police officer continues to fight for his life. We're hearing that doctors are still very concerned over the swelling in his brain. The officer was shot in the head Sunday night by a gunman on Detroit's west side. Uh, the suspect in the case was shot and killed by officers. The injured officer today still in grave condition and still in a medically induced coma. 
Oakland University has named its next president. She is Ora Hirsch Peskovitz. Peskovitz is former head of the University of Michigan Health System. She'll take her new post at Oakland University on August 13th under a five-year contract. Peskovitz was chosen over former Kelly Services CEO Carl Camden for the role. Uh, she is replacing former President George Hind. New at 5.30. It's a weapon officers for 18,000 other agencies carry, but Detroit police officers don't have it. Coming up, we'll tell you how that's about to change. It could be so much worse. If you thought our rain was bad, just wait until you see what folks from Arkansas to Illinois are up against tonight. And four live radar doesn't look a whole lot different than it did early this morning. More rain continuing to cycle up from the south. We'll look at how long this is going to last and those totals that we're expecting by the end of the weekend. Coming up next on Local 4 News at 530. It's dinner time. We'll start things at 530 here with that weather alert because heavy rain continues to fall. You're taking a look at live pictures right now from Metro Airport where travelers are seeing just a few delays, but we all know the rain is far from over. Ben is uh, watching a pretty miserable situation out there right now. Yeah, I mean, it's inconvenient. It's a nuisance. We haven't had any serious problems yet. The roads are being able to keep up with this, uh, but we've still got two more days of it way to go to yeah. go. Uh, so let's start out with four live radar, which is showing that the northern sections of the area is seeing some indication that the rain is picking up in intensity a little bit across parts of our north zone. Uh, but the general picture is just solid rain from south to north. And you start zooming in a little bit here around the city. What we did see was light rain for most of the afternoon is picking up in intensity. The yellow colors are a little bit heavier down here towards Taylor Allen Park and uh, further down river. You can see that push of water is heading pretty much right up the east side. You've really got to go all the way down into northern parts of Ohio and Indiana to find some breaks, but even these are not going to last long. We're talking five, 10 minutes here, and then that rain is going to continue. So really, we're looking for this to be pretty much continuous rain through the evening hours tonight, and temperatures are not going anywhere. Just about the mid 40s all the way through midnight, not falling much tonight, not rising much tomorrow, and we'll see more of this on Friday as well. We'll look at those totals and what you can do to prevent flooding at your house in your neighborhood coming up here at 545. Guys? And with all that rain to come, we got a lot to worry about. We're lucky we're not underwater yet because that is the situation in other parts of the Midwest. Yeah, we're talking mainly about cities, towns, and farms of Missouri, Arkansas, dealing with massive flooding today. All of it from a rain-soaked system that's moving east, pretty much just drenching everything in its path. Arkansas governor describing the flooding so far as being of epic proportions, also deploying the National Guard. Thousands of people are out of their homes as rivers are still rising. Breaches are threatened along dozens of levees as well in those states. Act in nature. There's not a not a whole lot you can do, but um, try to stay prepared. It's cold. It's raining. It's bad. I, I'd like to go home. And as you may have heard, forecasters are saying the historic flooding really is far from over. In other news tonight, Detroit police officers will soon have a new weapon with them on the streets and one that is expected to save lives. And these are so-called electronic control weapons, better known as tasers. Jason Colthorpe live at Detroit Police Headquarters, and that's where a Board of Police Commissioners meeting just wrapped up. Jason? Uh, you know, they tried this, Detroit Police did, a while back, a few years ago, and they led City Council and the Board of Commissioners test out some taser-like weapons, and it didn't go well. There was some injury, so they scrapped it. But that was before James Craig became police chief. Today, he reintroduced it in the Board of Commissioners. Their sentiment, basically, this is way overdue. Uh, we're quite simply behind the times. Behind the times, considering research shows 18,000 other agencies use tasers, while Detroit police do not. It is our hope that every Swarm personnel in operations has a taser, including our detective personnel. To convince the Board of Police Commissioners, DPD showed the effect tasers had in Cincinnati. After six years there of having electronic weapons, a 35% drop in the use of force by officers and a 47% decline in even having to use the taser. Above all, though, police say it's about protecting everyone involved. See the issues that are arising due to the fact that you have to still engage this person in close quarters, physically engage the suspect. The board showed overwhelming support unanimously passing a motion to amend the DPD code to allow the use of electronic weapons. 
So uh, this does not need city council approval. So this is a done deal. What happens next is they send this out for a bid, purchase these weapons, and then get the out officers outfitted with them. Reporting live at Detroit Police Headquarters, Jason Coltharp, Local 4. And I know it just happened then, Jason, but do they know how long that'll take? Well, they'll, once they get all the uh, procedural stuff done, uh, officers will undergo eight hours of training, everyone who will carry this, and they expect to have these guys deployed with these weapons in the next few months. All right, we'll keep following. All right, Jason. Across Michigan tonight, stories from Oceana County and Osceola Township. Uh, let's start this roundup, though, in Flint, which is where charges against a former utility administrator were dismissed in connection with the Flint water crisis. Last year, Michael Glasgow re reached a plea deal after facing charges for tampering with a report. As part of the deal, he pleaded no contest to willful neglect of duty in exchange for a tampering with evidence charge being dismissed. Well, today, Glasgow's remaining charge was dropped after he did cooperate with the state's investigation into what's happened in Flint's water system. In Oceana County, a man was arrested after he drove into a store. Police say 35-year-old Matthew Kruger drove his pickup truck right into a ShopGo store. This happened Wednesday afternoon, and in fact, you can see here he caused some serious damage to the store, which had to close for several hours so that they could clean up the mess. Kruger has been charged now with malicious destruction of a building, assault with a dangerous weapon, also reckless driving. He is now being held on a $100,000 bond. In Osceola Township, a major bottled water company fighting for its right to pump groundwater. Last month, the Township Planning Commission denied Nestle a permit for a pipeline booster station at Spring Hill Camp. That pipeline is part of the company's plan to withdraw up to 400 gallons of water each minute from a well in the county. Now Nestle appealing that decision. Nestle saying its new permit request is now pending. This morning was a special and emotional time for the families of fallen Detroit police officers. Uh, Chief Craig and the Detroit Police Department presented plaques to the families commemorating uh, their late Those loved ones. Targets. Plaques honored Captain Kenneth Steele and Corporal Myron Jarrett, who were both killed last year in the line of duty. Eight Detroit police officers have been killed or injured in shootings, though, since September of last year. I would hope and, and pray that there will be a day that uh, occasions like this would not be necessary to come and add names uh, to this wall, but unfortunately we have not gotten there yet. Their respective plaques are now uh, mounted on the Fallen Officer Memorial Wall, which is at Detroit Public Safety Headquarters. Well, today we learned the full lineup for Detroit Music Weekend with none other than Aretha Franklin headlining the field. Detroit Music Weekend is a free event. It's three days long. It's a music festival that is set to take place in Detroit's downtown entertainment district this summer. The festival will run from June 9th through the 11th, and it will include big names like Aretha Franklin, Mayor Hawthorne, and Mitch Ryder as well. Cool. Uh, the prayers started in 1960. And tonight they've paid off. Detroit's most storied priest, Father Solanus Casey, is beatified. And that, in fact, puts Casey, who started the Capuchin Soup Kitchen, one step away from sainthood. Rod Maloney is here now to tell us about the Good Father's life and how the news has also brought some of the Catholic faithful here in Metro Detroit to tears. He was a poor Irish farm kid from Wisconsin, one of 16 children. He was a logger, a prison guard a trolley conductor and then priest. He came to Detroit and now he's on his way to becoming a saint. You're looking at Father Solanus's tomb. He died in 1957. Ever since, Metro Detroiters have come here praying to the humble Capuchin father for help and healing. They leave petitions on small slips of paper and it's in this very spot that the Vatican says a miracle happened. Father David Proust explains how a woman's genetic skin disease disappeared. The medical doctors in their home country, Detroit and Rome, all attested that there was no scientific explanation for the cure. Father Casey played the violin, though not especially well, say his fellow friars. It was his quiet, calming ways expressing his faith that so electrified the poor and the hungry. His grandniece, Sister Anne Herkenrath, met him only once, but said for all the fame that came with his healing powers. There was nothing outstanding about him. He would, and he, he acted so normally that I forgot that he was, you know, a holy person. Father Solana spent 21 years in Detroit and took the first step toward sainthood in 1995 when Pope John Paul II declared him venerable. 
As for beatification. It's overwhelming. I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, I am really in awe of, of all of this. The final step to sainthood is called canonization. But Father Solanus needs another miracle approved by the Vatican. And that could take several more years. In Detroit, Rod Maloney, Local 4. It's an astonishing road that they've been on for a long time trying to make this happen. He would become the first ever American-born right. male saint if it were to, become, to get to that. And Rod talked about that a little bit earlier today. I love how his family says he just acted so normally yeah, yeah. that you would forget he was a holy, holy <laughs> he man. He is a, right? a saint, even. Right? Yes, indeed. Well, Britain's Prince Philip is set to retire. Buckingham Palace, in fact, made the announcement today after reports of an emergency meeting at the palace this morning. It is now official. Prince Philip, who is 95, will no longer attend any public events starting in the fall, largely due to the physical demands. Buckingham Palace says the Queen will continue to carry out her public engagements, though. It's funny because so many people have watched the Crown series. Everybody feels, I think, more connected, engaged right? and connected to the whole story. Einstein Bagels has come up with a pretty unusual way to boost your energy in the morning. Coming up new here at 530, what this bagel has in it that makes it the first of its kind. Doc? So is this a distracting toy or a helpful tool? Coming up, what experts really think of fidget spinners and if they truly help kids concentrate. All right, Doc, but first, an elementary school teacher arrested on drug charges. You won't believe how police cracked the case. Next. It's new at 6. Who is really living here at the Cadillac Square apartment? The city of Detroit wants to find out. In fact, the city filed a lawsuit against the apartment complex owner to get the facts about who is really paying taxes. All right, Jermon, also new research on young children and screen time. How too much of it can set them back in a very important part of their education. A Facebook discovery leads to a drug bust inside an Oklahoma elementary school. Sepulpa police arrested 27-year-old Megan Sloan on Monday for control, drug, and embezzlement charges. This was after the teacher left her Facebook logged in on another teacher's computer. Well, her messages revealed a conversation about selling and using heroin. Police say Sloan also confessed to stealing from the school and her students. She is now suspended pending the outcome of that investigation. In good health, they are called fidget toys and spinners. It's a little device like these, right, that some say actually improves your concentration. Uh, since the beginning of the year, these have really exploded in popularity. Dr. Frank Me George here to talk about whether or not they actually improve focus or am I just playing with a cool toy? <laughs> Depends on who you ask, it seems. <laughs> but in point of fact, fidgets like this little cube existed long before the recent craze. And things like this have been used to help kids with ADHD and autism who have sensory issues or difficulty with attention. The real question now is, should every kid use one or is this maybe just a distraction? Before this came a, became a craze, there, there were a group of fidget cubes or other sensory tools that could be appropriate for kids in some cases. Dr. Janelle Phillips is a pediatric neuropsychologist at Henry Ford Hospital who treats children with a range of issues, including ADHD and autism. She says the devices don't really benefit most kids. Maybe 2% of kids that are in a regular education setting may need or may benefit from some sort of sensory tool. Nonetheless, their explosion in popularity has brought fans. I think they're a good distraction. I don't think there's anything bad about them. And critics, with many schools now banning spinners in particular. Generally, I don't support these, period. As, as a former teacher and principal, I think I truly understand the disruption for teachers. When it comes to spinners, Dr. Phillips agrees. I don't see the clinical purpose for a spinner. This is definitely more of a fad and a toy with the spinners that are being snuck into the classroom. That's especially true for the brightly colored or light up toys. There's no way that that this that a child could look at this and somehow this would help facilitate learning or attention. Because by nature this is designed to distract. But this doesn't mean there's no role for other related and ideally less disruptive fidgets, especially for children with ADHD or autism. Some sort of other fidget cube would be helpful to better maintain a level of alertness. So it keeps them grounded and it keeps them regulated. This can be more um, inconspicuous and, and used kind of more discreetly in your lap or in a pocket. Here's the big picture though. Really what I see is that now that these are 
have become banned in some classrooms, banned in some schools. And so kids that, the few kids that may legitimately benefit from some of these may not have access to them. Now, Dr. Phillips suggests that if sensory devices are banned in a school or classroom, but an individual child has a legitimate use for one, their situation really does need to be considered on an mm -hmm. individual basis. Yeah, and you have to wonder, though, what schools are saying about this and what they're doing, because i got to show you here. I know a, a certain yes. seven-year-old, uh -huh. you might recognize <laughs> recognize this face here. He, he actually, if you look at the table right there, you can There's see his spinner. spinner, and one of his teachers actually sent me that picture yesterday, unrelated <laughs> to the spinner, but just because he had made a mess in, in class. <laughs> um, and you can see that he, you know, he has a spinner, and he says that every kid in class has one. Well, I think they better enjoy them while they have them because some schools are banning them or at least they're limiting their use to recess time. But truthfully, everyone that has kids is aware of these things and they say the problem is, like anything that's really popular, kids are now trading them, they're losing them, they're throwing them, and they're becoming a big distraction. But schools do see the benefit for some select students, so they, they really are trying to focus yeah. on the select yeah. cases where they might be useful. But in general, I think the jury is in, spinners especially, yeah. not really that useful. So mm. let's say that your kid has made a big mess in school and your mother outs you on television. <laughs> how, how do you feel about that? <laughs> well, he's not watching, so we're okay. <laughs> there you go. Just as long as he doesn't have uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Be fine. We're, we're in good shape there. We got, we got this for you. Oh, thank you. Way. Yeah, I'll it take might it. help you focus. You needed I to do that. I doubt it. Well, there was no baseball game for you today, so you needed something like this, I had, right? I had listened to my Spinner's albums at home. <laughs>